Hi, everybody. It's always an occupational hazard to uh, preach from a music stand. <laughs> Few churches actually have pulpits anymore. Um, but I have a heavy iPad, and on more than one occasion, it's gone. Whoosh. <laughs> but I keep it wrapped in a heavy bulletproof enclosure, and so far it's protected me, so we'll hope we do well. Uh, before I talk, I just wanted to um, introduce you to a few products that we brought. I don't have an extensive table set up today, which for some who have been to other meetings might seem unusual, but um, I slimmed it down for the purposes of what we're doing. I'm going to talk today about um, inner healing. It's an introduction to inner healing, but I have a whole conference that I did with a couple of friends on the topic of inner healing. And If you want to go deeper and learn more, this would be what you want to get right there, rediscovering the ministry of inner healing. I think the last time I came here, um, I taught on grief, which is definitely an inner healing topic, and so we brought copies of this along if you would like to uh, re- learn that material or hear it for the first time if you weren't present. And then I've got another one that I put it in the physical healing category, and I call these memorials. It's based in a passage of, uh, found in Isaiah 26. Um, it is physical healing, but it's, it's based on an inner healing concept. And a lot of times there's a, there's a continuum where <clears throat> one category of healing impacts another category of healing. And so for people who have memorials, they have physical problems in their body that don't get healed through regular healing prayer because they have a, an unresolved issue with somebody who, in this case, uh, was dominating them or oppressing them or, the term I use, overlording them. But whichever term you choose to use, it's, it's related to a situation where people have been subjugated and it creates physical problems in their bodies. I have some case studies that I describe. So maybe memorials interest you. And of course, when you're talking about inner healing, you can hardly talk of, do it without talking about deliverance. Now, we are not teaching on deliverance today, but deliverance is a common thing. Uh, in many churches, it's, it's taboo. But um, Jesus did a lot of it. And the apostles did a lot of it. And so if we're going to have a thoroughgoing ministry to deal with those who are oppressed and afflicted, um, who may be depressed <laughs> uh, or conflicted, we have to at times go into the realm of uh, the demonic and drive demons out of people. And so this is a, a series on basic deliverance, which if you haven't had any training, that will get you started and then this one I brought along, even though it's a little bit off the, the topic since I brought this series on deliverance, how deliverance ministry hastens the return of Christ. You may not have ever thought about those two being linked, but they are actually quite tightly linked. And I show how that works out of the teaching of Jesus from what's commonly called the Olivet Discourse, or the last teaching he gave on the sermon, uh, gave in the sermon from the Mount of Olives. Um, this is a newer series we came out with last year. It's an introduction to the integrated healing model. So if you didn't catch it as I was describing it, uh, sometimes inner healing relates to deliverance, which relates to physical healing, which can relate to social problems, which can relate to mental problems, which all flow together into one big mess. But this talks about how do we think about these various strands and how getting people healed may require dealing with each piece, and as they as they come together in the human system, in the individual, <clears throat> as we clean all of that up, we get comprehensive and substantive healings for those who are in need of them. All right, that's not going to stay, so I'll do that. And then the last thing I just want to hold up is I have in my hand here a little card. It looks like a credit card. This one says Collection 8 on it. We actually have 24 uh, individual cards available. And if you take the shrink wrap off, and you do this, suddenly you've opened up a USB that you can plug into your computer, and you can play it on your computer, or you can uh, transfer the files to your iPhone or your iPad, um, as you prefer, or if you're less enlightened to your Samsung Galaxy phone. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Anyway, so um, we have a bunch of topics. This particular one in my hand deals with the subject matter of advanced deliverance. It's collection eight. But we have <clears throat> several 
areas, 24 collections available, and uh, you might want to take a look at those. For a lot of people, they prefer to get their media by MP3 these days rather than discs, and probably at some point we'll stop selling the discs. But so far we're still selling them because people still buy them, and um, you know, if you, if you have a car, you might want to use the discs in your car, although increasingly cars have uh, players in them that, uh, that will Bluetooth to your phone, so I suppose that's, an, that's a technology on its way out, but there you go. All right. Well, we want to talk about inner healing today, so um, I... I just want to make a few introductory remarks here. Inner healing is uh, is a catch-all phrase, and it refers to a series of practices that people employ, sometimes known as healing of memories, <clears throat> sometimes referred to as healing of emotions. Those aren't actually the same thing. When we're talking about inner healing, we're talking about healing the soul. And for many people, the soul is a ill-defined concept. They've heard the word thrown around. They may have seen it in the Bible. Uh, if you use a King James Bible, you see the word soul. They may have heard a pastor use the term. But, but what is the soul? Well, classically in Christian theology, the soul has three parts to it, three parts to the soul. And one of them is the mind, and one of them is the emotions. The third part, which we won't emphasize so much, is the will. It's not that the will is unimportant, it's just its own animal. But when we talk about the mind and the emotions, we actually need to subdivide those because all of us have a future mind, a present mind, and a past mind. Our future mind we generally call our imagination or sometimes anticipation. But it's that ability to conceptualize about something that at the moment doesn't even exist. So Thomas Edison had an imagination when he came up with the electric light bulb, right? He, he had the idea of a candle that would burn longer, that didn't even look like a candle that could light a house. Of course, it needed a technology that wasn't really widely available yet called electricity. So there was a whole thing behind that. But anyway, Thomas Edison had a concept. He had something that he imagined called the electric light. So that's your future mind. And then your present mind is, well, it's your current day consciousness. It's, it's your ability to interact with the world and to perceive what's going on around you. And then we have this past mind that we call memories. And many times people have had experiences where their memories have been damaged. And this happens because they had bad experiences. They were traumatic or, you know, shameful, which isn't always the same thing. But... You know, shame can be a, a powerful thing that holds people back. And there can be other things as well, but I'm just trying to frame the conversation. And similarly with the emotions, you can have future emotion, which is anticipatory. I'm going to get married to my one true love. I'm so excited. Okay, uh, assuming you are excited. Sometimes people approach the altar and they're like, no. <laughs> That's another kind of anticipation, right? But... Assuming that you know you're in love, or it might be your child. Again, it could be positive or negative. My daughter's marrying the most wonderful man. I can't wait to have him as my son-in-law. Or who is this rascal that's getting my <laughs> led her down the primrose path? And I know this is going to come to no good end. So you have this anticipation of what dread, anger, something like that. That's your future emotions. Now remember the the mem the emotion. And the, and the memory, they aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, and this is true in the future and in the past. So we talked about the future emotion. Uh, the current emotion is, well, whatever you're feeling. Hopefully at this moment right now, your emotional level is close to neutral. Now, if you had a bad encounter you know, on the road out there before you came in, you might still be having some road rage. So your emotional state could be negative at this moment. It could be anger-laced. It could be sort of keyed up, um, or maybe it's not all that. <clears throat> but anyway, you have the, the emotions that are with you in the moment, in the present. And then there's past emotion, where when you think about certain events, you start to feel, again, shameful, angry, frightened, 
and on it goes. So when we're dealing with inner healing, we're dealing most particularly with the things of the past that deal with the mind and the emotions. And the reason that both matter is because if you think of the human soul having three parts, again, mind, emotions, and will, if you want to, think of a triangle. So we'll put one on each corner. We've got mind, emotions, and will. Or if you don't like that order, you can put mind down here, emotions, and will, or rotate it again and you know, mind, emotions, and will. But wherever you put them, what you immediately see is that because it's a triangle, in the end, everything touches everything else. So again, we are integrated beings, and this is true even in that subcomponent of who we are called the soul. So we're dealing with most particularly uh, emotions and memories. And so inner healing, as I said, is a catch-all phrase, and it, it captures the healing of memories. It also deals with the healing of emotions. And it was introduced to the modern church around 45 or 50 years ago now, through the life, the writings, and the ministries of people with names like Agnes Sanford. Agnes Sanford was a Presbyterian, and for a lot of you in a church like this one today, I mean, Presbyterian isn't even on your list of churches that you would even give any thought to, but there are still Presbyterian churches that function in the land. Some are better than others. A lot of what we used to call the mainline denominations are having... Well, they're having struggles. They're, they're in some ways in decline. Uh, maybe their theology has become unworkable. Uh, they may be focused on things that wouldn't particularly interest folks like you. But there was a time when American Christianity in sub and substance was really represented by these mainstream movements. And so inner healing was coming up out of the Presbyterian church through the woman of Agnes Sanford. There was also another woman named Leanne Payne and she was an Episcopalian. Now today, I don't think they'd be doing much of this in the Episcopal Church, but there was a time during the charismatic renewal of the 1970s when there was another move of God's Spirit among his people where the Episcopalians were actually right on the leading edge of all this. One church that was part of that is a church not far from here called St. Paul's in Darien, Connecticut. And then there's another one out where I live in Los Angeles called St. Luke's, uh, which is in what we call the Valley, San Fernando Valley. But the Episcopalians were uh, involved in all this, and so Leanne Payne was a, was a spokesman of this in, uh, within the Episcopal communion. And then within the Baptist streams, there was Ruth Carter Stapleton, and if you caught the name Carter, she was the sister of President Jimmy Carter. Now, I can remember vaguely when, the, when he was president that occasionally the media would say, because they didn't understand this at all, they would say, she's a faith healer. So the president has a faith healer sister, and of course this was viewed as questionable. But um, I would not have said actually that, that Ruth Carter Stapleton was a faith healer. She, she engaged in Christian healing, but mostly she didn't do physical healing. Mostly what she did was healing of emotions and healing of memories. And when people think faith healer, they generally think of physical healing or snake handling. <laughs> um, and she wasn't really doing much physical healing. I mean, because of the integrated nature of the human system, yes, there were times in ministries like I've already named, those of Agnes Sanford or Ruth Carter Stapleton, Leanne Payne, out of order, but anyway. Um, in, the, in the ministries of these people, yes, physical healings would transpire. But that really wasn't the focus of what they were after. They were really seeking to heal damaged emotions and damaged memories. But not all of these early leaders were women. Uh, there was a man named Tommy Tyson, and there was another man named David Seamans, uh, S-E-A-M-A-N-D-S. And all of these people wrote their own books. So if you want to study this further, you know, just get out your Amazon app or your Barnes & Noble app and, you know, type in these names and the entire repertoire of everything they ever wrote will come up and you can go broke buying their books. <laughs> but um, Tommy Tyson and David Seamans, these two men, they were Methodists. And so, you know, they were doing this. And then there was Father Mike Scanlon, who was a Roman Catholic. Uh, there was another woman named Rita Bennett. She was also an Episcopalian like Lee Ann Payne. But interestingly, she was married to a man named Dennis Bennett, who was one of the premier leaders in America 
of renewal and awakening within the Episcopal Church. So I'm just throwing out some names. There are, there are many more we could talk about. Uh, one of them was John Sanford. He died only last year. Uh, he was a Congregationalist. Who would have ever thought of any healing ministry coming out of the Congregational Church if you know anything about the Congregational Church at all? It just seems totally incongruous, and yet there it was. And uh, Judith McNutt continues to practice this ministry. Uh, she is a Roman Catholic. She was married to Father Francis McNutt, who left the priesthood, obviously, to marry her. Um, and Francis McNutt died only about a month and a half ago, and they just finished holding his funeral. Um, I think it was two and a half weeks ago or three weeks ago. Uh, but Judith continues to carry on with the ministry of inner healing. Interestingly, she and Francis, Francis had a very uh, prominent physical healing ministry. He prayed for healing of memories and emotions also. Judith has a very prominent uh, ministry of healing memories and emotions, but a less prominent ministry of physical healing. So when you put the two of them together, they were almost a perfect book match to each other. Well, anyways, I've already said, it should be obvious, these early uh, pioneers, they tended to come from mainline liturgical sacramental backgrounds, although this wasn't exclusive. And I might add they encountered significant opposition, not a little bit. I mean, sometimes their entire denomination would be set against them, even in the face of the uh, positive benefit people were reporting getting from the prayer that they received. And there were a lot of reasons for this. First of all, and most probably more, more importantly than any of it, is just that these things simply weren't done in these mainstream churches. And so it was viewed with suspicion. Now, this is, this is kind of the way it rolls in everything in life. There are norms of behavior. And if you violate those norms of behavior, that in itself will be enough to invoke a sudden death clause. And that's the end of it. You're just taken out with the trash. I went to lunch with some friends today, and as we were walking out of the restaurant, uh, one of the people that I just had lunch with was telling me about someone I'm aware of. I've not met him, but I'm aware of him, and he's written a book. Um, this guy was at the University of Chicago, I think, uh, but he was, he was getting a PhD, and he managed to get a postdoctorate at Harvard, so obviously this guy is fairly smart. And he was doing quite well in his field until an article appeared in, I think it was the Chicago Sun Tribune, about how he had, and a few people from his home Bible study, or something like that, some small group he was involved with, had tried to raise someone from the dead. And he was named in the article. And when it turned out, when, when the, you know, the academic community learned that this individual had been in, involved in an attempt to raise someone from the dead, it was sudden death. And he instantly was shut out. He could no longer find teaching engagements. Uh, universities didn't want to talk to him. He was just viewed as completely bankrupt intellectually. And today he pastors a church in Hawaii. Well, that's not a bad answer, but that's not what he was trained to do. And it, it gives you an example of somebody who violated the social norms. Academics don't try to raise the dead. Right? So that's what these people all ran into. They were doing something that violated social norms, expected outcomes and behaviors. Now, those norms don't just come from anywhere. They, they are rooted in something. And so the other accusations that came along with the fact that it was not what we do here, uh, people would say that inner healing was Eastern or it was New Age or maybe it was based in Christian science in some kind of a new garb. And so, you know, people used all kinds of things to try to run it down. And, and I would say on some level, even to this day, there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know, blood in the water around the topic of inner healing. It ought not to be, by the way. I'm, I'm a supporter of inner healing. I wouldn't be teaching on it if I, if I didn't believe in it. And I've seen the effect of it. It's very powerful. But Notwithstanding, if people don't have context, if they don't understand what's going on, uh, oftentimes it's very easy to reject these things and to leave them sort of hanging to die on the vine. So what is inner healing? Well, number one, it is release from pain. And when I say pain, it could be that there's physical pain involved, but I don't necessarily 
think immediately of physical pain. What I'm really thinking about is the inner pain, the anguish of memories that haunt you or the emotion that isn't resolved around, well, this, that, and the other thing that has been in your life for years. Now, that pain could arise from any number of sources. If you were the victim of sexual abuse as a child, you know, you might have shame issues around sexuality and the expression of proper human sexuality. If you were beat up on the playground as a kid, you were bullied or chased after school and threats were made, you might find yourself at times you know, on edge in certain environments. You are, as we say today, triggered. And you, you don't know where to, what to do with those emotions that you just find them welling up. You don't even know where they come from. Or you walk into an environment and you go, this reminds me of something else. Now, th at that moment, it's not so much emotional but mental. It's a memory issue. But you go, this looks like that other thing. And all of a sudden... <laughs> You're just frozen, you're rigid, you're tense, you just have no ability to cope. And so when I'm talking about pain in this moment, I, again, I'm not specifically thinking of physical pain, although sometimes people do have physical pain in their bodies that arises from these past events. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't exclude physical pain, but I'm most particularly thinking about internal pain that people carry. By the way, inner healing is really necessary um, for a lot of people just trying to decide if I should even say this. I feel like I'm going to touch the third wire. Inner healing is necessary for a lot of people who are uh, involved in what we today call body art. Because most people who are involved in body art, and I don't mean the artists, I mean the people who are having it done to them, they are carrying significant amounts of internal pain. It could be rejection, it could be uh, related to watching family trauma and drama. Uh, it could be any number of things. They may have lost a loved one or a sibling. They want to commemorate that sibling. Uh, they may be victims of sexual abuse. They may have any number of things going on. And so they decide to decorate their body. But what's really going on for most of those people is they're carrying pain. And it's mental and emotional pain. And they don't know what to do with that pain. So I want to draw an analogy here. We've got this person here who's got mental or emotional pain related to something. And then over here, I'm going to say we've got a cancer patient. Well, when a person has cancer and they start having pain, what do we do? Medicate, Medicate them. We give them morphine most commonly, but maybe methadone or something else. All right, so we medicate the pain. And for a period of time, it mutes it out, maybe, maybe suppresses it altogether in the best case. And then over time, the pain starts to rise again, so what do we do? Remedicate them. And then the pain starts to rise again, and then we remedicate them. And then the pain rises again, and we remedicate them. Okay, so this is our cancer patient. Here we've got a person with physical trauma, emotional trauma, mental grief, They've got, they've got damage in their memories. They've got damage in their past emotions. They need to medicate too. So what do they do? They go get their body art, whichever form of it they choose to go after. And so they get their body art. And if you talk to anyone who's done this, they'll tell you, I felt euphoric. I felt so much better for a while. For some people, it might be a couple of days. For some, it might be a couple of months. But after a bit, they say, but... Then I felt the need to get another one. Well, what they're, if you talk to them, if you listen and you ask your questions, <coughs> excuse me, thoughtfully and carefully, thank you. If you ask your questions thoughtfully and carefully, what you'll hear them saying is, I felt the euphoria after my first round of body art, and so the pain level dropped, but after a while, it started to rise. And so I thought, well, I felt better after that first round of body art. I think I'll get some more. And then the pain decreased. But after a while, the pain level started to rise, so I better get some more body art. And so they get some more. Does this look like this? Yes, it does. It's a different cause, though. This one's caused by a physical problem called cancer. 
And so we use medication, morphine or methadone or whatever we're using, to deal with it. And over here, we're using something that is, I'll say, psycho-spiritual to deal with it. A lot of people in our society are self-medicating. Not over here. You can't get a hold of heroin that way. You can't on the street. Um, you can't get a hold of um, morphine. You can't get a hold of methadone. Well, in a, in a clinic you might. But for the most part, opioids are controlled. They're not readily available. If you know where to go, you can find them. But for the most part, this is harder to do. But this one, we medicate in all kinds of ways. Body art is only one way that I mentioned. But there are a lot of people who are taking drugs. And by the way, I would add to this, now I'm really going to touch the third rail, that the legalization of marijuana and even the mainstreaming of CBD oil is part of that. And the reason that it's become mainstream is the level of pain in our society has become so high that people are looking for anything that they can do. And so literally, I'm not exaggerating here at all, the masses have cried out and said, give us our pot so we can manage our pain. And the politicians have said, we will give the masses what they are asking for. Does this make sense? Because, you know, the, the damaging effects of marijuana and of THC and all of it, this has been documented for a long time. There's a reason why this used to be all in the realm of regulated substances and there were laws against it. It wasn't just that the government was being controlling. They were trying to maintain what we would call a safe and orderly society. And so they knew that this stuff was dangerous. But eventually the voices crying out for something to relieve them became so loud that they said, hey, if we don't respond to the, the demands of the people, we'll be voted out of office. And so the politicians rolled over. That's really what has happened in this country. Here's another form of self-medication, alcohol. There are a lot of people who can't go a whole week without a drink, and many can't go a whole day without a drink. And some of them are living in pretty upscale neighborhoods because they have ultra-high-pressure ultra jobs in, well, jobs in Manhattan, we'll just say that. And we all know what some of those jobs could be. But obviously, it, you don't have to have one of those kind of jobs. You could be, you could be working as a school teacher. You could be working as a, you know, whatever, somebody somewhere, and you just got to come home and have a couple of brewskis every night. You're self-medicating. And much of the time what you're dealing with is this very thing of pain that is in your emotions or in your memories. And here's another form of self-medication. Shop till you drop. Run your credit card bills to the sky because every time you buy, you get a hit of satisfaction and euphoria. I bought the latest whatchamacallit, the last winky-do, right? And so I need the next winky-do now that I've just dealt with that winky-do. And so suddenly it becomes a habitual thing. And every day a box shows up at Amazon, or from Amazon at your doorstep. Are we communicating? And the reason I'm going into all this is because I want you to see how bad the pain is in this country. And it's right here in Queens, too. So I'm not saying that America was ever perfect, but I think there was a time where our spirituality was healthier and probably more robust. And with that, people managed some of the conflicts and difficulties of life through the spiritual interface that God himself made available and America was probably safer and healthier on balance, albeit still with problems. So inner healing uh, is release from pain. Number two, inner healing is correction of ungodly responses to past hurts and memories. Now, what is an ungodly response? Well, it's a response that is not consistent with the way God would have us to live. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, there's a lot we could say about that. I mean, you could preach a year-long sermon series on it, but since we don't have a year, I'll just say, in the book of Galatians, Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit, the manifestation of God's Spirit in our lives, if he is allowed to express himself as he wants to, what our lives should be characterized by are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, I'm going to throw out love, joy, and peace, not because I don't think they're important, but because a lot of times people just sort of go, love, joy, peace, and they don't really think too much about 
what that might entail. And so they are important, but, but I'm going to just set them aside because it's easy to slot into automatic response, and with that we lose the impact of it. Except I will say this. You generally know a loving person when you meet one. They don't have to tell you they're doing what they're doing out of love. You feel loved. When you meet somebody who's filled with peace or who is peaceable rather than argumentative and combative, like modern talk show radio, (laughs) you know when you're around a peaceable person. If you meet somebody who's joyful, there's a kind of, I don't know, they, they... they're upbeat. They have a sense of optimism about them. They, there's, they don't face life with kind of, that's not going on. So, all right, now we've said all we're going to say about love, joy, and peace. Patience. When you meet a patient person, do you know you're around a patient person? Sure you do. In fact, oftentimes they're patient in the face of what you might consider to be truly horrendous, obnoxious, and offensive behavior, and yet they are still patient people. Why? Because the Spirit of God is in control. Kindness. What does a kind person look like? Well, they they do nice things for people, and they sometimes do it seemingly for no reason. And you may just be sitting there, and I don't know, I mean, it, it could happen in the workplace. Someone's just sitting there at their desk, and somebody stops by and says, here, I just brought you this cup of coffee or tea. Why? I don't know. I just wanted to, I just wanted to bless you. I wanted to be kind. Right? So we've got patience, kindness, And gentleness. Now, gentleness is not a highly prized trait in our society today. In fact, I I would go further. I think, in general, American society has become very rough, coarse, and uncouth. And with that, we we deliberately almost exalt ungentle and rough, coarse, and uncouth behavior. If you need any proof of that, just look at what goes on in, in your social media feed. As people are arguing and debating about this and that, there's no gentleness in it. There's no respect in it. It's just you're wrong and you suck. And and usually the language is stronger than I just used. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Well, you know, there is, it's almost, it almost seems, I don't know, out of date to talk about goodness. But you know, there are people who actually have good hearts. They don't have some big agenda of self-promotion or scamming you. And yet, the idea that somebody could be utterly trustworthy because they're just good-hearted people, and if you handed them a wallet with 10,000 in cash in it, they would hand it back with 10,000 in cash in it. That idea has almost completely vanished from the American consciousness. Every once in a while, you will see a news article or something about somebody who found a wallet and found the ID in it and then returned it. You will occasionally see those, but it's not very often. But there's that goodness. And what about self-control? What about being under control where you don't just fly off the handle? So inner healing corrects the ungodly responses that are the diametrically opposed things to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So when you look around you and you see people everywhere who are behaving in the manner that I was describing, and I didn't name all nine of the fruits of the Spirit or or unpack them a bit. Uh, I didn't do that, but, but you certainly know what I'm talking about. After all, you do live in New York, right? And New Yorkers are notorious for a particular kind of a, well, demeanor. (laughs) Did I say that well enough? (laughs) By the way, we have those same demeanors in Los Angeles, so. Uh, but, But the fact that we all are laughing about it, because we all know exactly what I'm talking about, and we may even be that guy once in a while, or that gal once in a while, maybe more than we want to admit, the fact that our neighbor or our spouse or our child or our boss or our pastor, did I just touch another third rail? <laughs> right? The, the, these people, our city councilman, our representative, our senator, our president, behaves in this way. If this isn't proof that we need inner healing, I can't give you any more proof. I might as well just close my iPad, sit down, and we'll just get going with the praying part. But inner healing will correct ungodly responses that are 
reactive and reflexive. They sort of come up out of nowhere on a moment's notice. And you don't even know why is it this way. And it's, it's this way because either your memories are damaged or your emotions are damaged or both are damaged. And when something happens, you get triggered and suddenly... And that is an ungodly response. And that's why we need inner healing. So when we talk about inner healing, part of what we're doing is we're actually bringing about something that, again, we don't like to talk about it too much. We're talking about sanctification, becoming Jesus-like, becoming holy, so that our actions as well as our attitudes and our words sound and act like Jesus. So when people look at you, they go, you're not like other people. Now, I'm far from perfect, and my friends could tell you that, and my wife could tell you better, but um, when I was in my corporate career, from time to time, I had this one boss in particular, and he would, I'd walk into his office, and we'd be working on something, and you know, we, I was in a big corporation, big semiconductor company, and I would just say there was a lot of bad behavior that went on in that corporation, and we were firing people every week for cause because of the things that they did, and they deserved it. They really did. None of these were what you would call retribution or what in the world of politics is known as a targeted killing. These were people who had done something and they were getting what their actions deserved. But all week long, you know, oh, another, one, another one was walked off campus today. So, you know, call the recruiter, get somebody next. So we had this kind of ongoing seesawing in and out and I had this one boss and we would sit down and talk and he would just look at me sometimes when we'd start and he'd go you know you're quirky I said what do you mean quirky quirky is not a good word <laughs> am I next <laughs> am I about to be walked up he go no 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 you, you, but that's what I mean you're quirky it's like you're honest you're patient with people when people throw you know the word I wanted to use, but I'm stopping because I'm in church. It starts with S, ends with T. When people throw that at you, you don't throw it back. Um, you know, when, when people are backbiting and saying things, you don't start some political thing to take them out. He said, that's really quirky behavior. Why do you not do that? And all I could think was, well, on some level, I guess the Holy Spirit is having his way. Maybe not as much as he should or could, but it, I'm ahead of them anyway. <laughs> maybe half a step, but it's enough that somebody's noticing it. So inner healing corrects those ungodly responses. And you know what I'm talking about. You deal with it constantly uh, in your homes, in your jobs, wherever you spend your days. It's part of the human condition. And the good news about it is God has an answer for these things. I mean, I, I love this about the Lord. No matter what the problem is, there's an answer for it in God. Now, you've got to do it his way. You can't just kind of go at it any old way you think. But there is an answer. All right, the third thing about inner healing is it's reframing or reinterpreting the past event or a past event. So a lot of times when people have had something happen to them, they view that event through the lens of their own trauma, their own damage, their own woundedness. And oftentimes that comes out of their mouth with, language like this, God abandoned me, or God isn't good, God isn't kind, why didn't God take care of me? But it can also be, you did this to me because this is the kind of person you are. Well, that could be true, but maybe it isn't true. What they're really doing is they're projecting their own judgments on that individual based on their past experiences and their own damage of emotions and, and memories, and as a consequence, they are... They are saying something which might not be right and with that they often close doors to reconciliation does that make sense and so what started as perhaps an accidental offense or something that wasn't a level 10 incident maybe it was a level one or two incident i mean still annoying and worthy of a of a of an apology or some sort of a you know reconciliation Suddenly, it's DEFCON 5, launch the nuclear missiles and, you know, lay the place waste. And again, you know what I'm talking about. You see it in your families. You see it in your, in your jobs. You see it in politics. It goes on and on and on. 
So when we reframe or reinterpret a past event, part of the closure that God gives us is to understand that which occurred in the light of his sovereignty and infinite ability so that you see that, you know, this, I had a completely mis- wrong conception, a misconception about what that was, and it, it colored everything, and I missed what God was ultimately doing in that moment. Does this make sense? It can be hard to hear, but um, I was going to talk about this point later, but let's just pause that, and I want to go to um, Genesis, where one of the best examples of inner healing that I know of in the Bible occurs. So in Genesis, I'm in chapter 45, in Genesis 45, Joseph is in Egypt, And I think all of you would know the story of how Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. Now talk about a damaging experience that would touch your emotions as well as your memories. Better move this or it's going to cause everything to flip over. Um, So Joseph's been in slavery. The Bible tells us that he was sold into slavery when he was 17 years old. And he stood before Pharaoh at 30. And most of you would know the story that after his period of imprisonment, he ultimately is elevated and becomes the second ruler of Egypt. But let's talk about 13 years of pain, of living in an Egyptian hellhole where he was thrown for unjustly being accused of attempted rape, of his family, his brothers, selling him into slavery. Hello? I mean, you think you had a bad family. (laughs) right so they sell him into slavery and it says not in the passage we're going to look at that as he was being ridden away by the ishmaelites as it were probably tied to the camel's you know saddle if he's if he's lucky enough to ride maybe he's walking and so his hands are tied and he has to walk god only knows how many hundreds of miles from where he was sold to where he is ultimately delivered to the new buyer who becomes this man named Potiphar who's the captain of the imperial guard he has all of this going on and it's you know on the on the low end the best part of it is i've got sore feet or or my butt sore from riding in a camel's saddle but you know you can imagine the ishmaelites they're whipping him to keep him going right he's probably not being fed very well i mean Sexual abuse has been known in every society of the world. Maybe that went on. Maybe it didn't. Who knows? But, you know, and then he gets sold. This this was the favored son. Think of all of this that's being carried by this man. And then he goes into this Egyptian prison after being accused unjustly of trying to rape his master's wife, which he didn't do. He has no voice, no ability to get out. He's completely forgotten. But God didn't forget him because it says God was with Joseph in prison. You know, no matter what your prison is, God is with you. No matter what's happened to you, God is with you. And it may just be that today is your day when God's going to spring you out of that prison. But you know, God being with Joseph in prison meant that somewhere in that 13-year process, 13 years, this is 2020, that means he was in prison from like 2007. We hadn't even had the global financial crisis. New York was a totally different place in 2007. Merrill Lynch still existed. Lehman Brothers still existed. Bank of America hadn't gone bankrupt and been bought by somebody else. They still use the name, but... That the institution went away. I mean, New York was a totally different place. So for 13 years, all of that has gone by and Joseph is forgotten and yet God was with Joseph in prison. <clears throat> and it doesn't merely mean that you know God continued to love Joseph. I think what God was doing was God was working on Joseph saying, son, you have to forgive. Son, these brothers of yours, what they did was wrong. But son, I have something better for you. But you'll never, you'll never secure what I have for you until you let this go. This, this thing that they did to you. And so, 
Eventually, Joseph, as you know, gets sprung from prison. He becomes the second ruler of the kingdom of Egypt after interpreting Pharaoh's dream, and more time goes by. Because when Joseph gets out of prison, he's now 30 years old, and he's got a job to do. He's interpreted Pharaoh's dream, but Pharaoh goes, great, I'm giving you a promotion. Let me give you the highest pressure job in the entire kingdom of Egypt. Save my kingdom. That's what Joseph is given. And so what does he have to do? They build storehouse cities, and during the seven years of plenty, they take all of the grain, and they have to store it, and they have to count it. Joseph's responsible for creating all of that. The accounting system, the distribution system, the warehousing, all the workers, everything that goes with that as they store up all this grain, and then the famine begins. So when the famine begins, Joseph is now 37 years old, and he's been away from home for 20 years. That's my warning not to go over time. Which I might. <laughs> but I'll try not to. So he's been away from home for 20 years. And somewhere into the next seven years, as the famine, it says, is very great in the land, look who comes calling but his own brothers. Now he has all the power in the world. He's the second ruler of Egypt. Only Pharaoh can override him. And I assure you, if he wanted to take a bunch of Hebrew shepherds and take them out and string them up or run them through or drag them behind a chariot, Pharaoh wouldn't have said a word because these things were commonplace. This is just what you do with people that are your enemies. Joseph could have done all of that, but instead it says that when the brothers come, and I'm skipping the kind of iteration with the silver cup and all that, you know the story or you should, but anyway, let's get to the chase here. Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by. I'm in Genesis 45.1, and he cried, have everyone go up from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Now these palaces, they were big. So this is like, Aah! this is loud. It is not pretty. And yet all this buried, pent-up emotions not having seen these guys for 20 years, remembering being sold, remembering being imprisoned, remembering being unjustly accused, and on and on. All of that is coming out. And then Joseph says to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. You know what they were doing? They're going, oh my God, it's him. Oh, there's that other word again, right? That's what they're doing, because they know what they did. And he has the power to just say, guards, execute these men. And so they're thinking, this is it, this is the end. Oh my gosh, our sin has come home to roost. And in fact, not in this passage, but in one of the other ones in Genesis, among themselves, they're having exactly that conversation. And Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And they're thinking, uh-huh, here it comes. He's just telling us why he's about to execute us. But now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves. It's all forgiven. And they're like, what? What planet are you from? Because you sold me here. Yes, you did. But God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Think about that. I had to go through what I went through so that your families would survive. Talk about reframing the memory. That's the whole point that I'm trying to make. Reframing the memory reinterpreting the past event. Joseph says God did this so that a great deliverance could be effected for you. You don't hear stories like this very much in our modern world, but inner healing will let you get to that place of reframing where you can forgive, forget. You won't ever fully forget. I don't mean forget in the sense of no longer having recollection of it. I mean forget in the sense of no longer using it as a point to grind the other party. 
and move on. So inner healing then becomes an exchange of the past negative effects for positive ones. And so with this, inner healing is a process rather than an event. Now, it usually does have specific events in time where that release happens. It usually does have specific events in time. You can call it a peak experience if you want to. You can call it a, an emotional resolution or a, you know, some sort of conflict revolu- resolution in the mind. You can call it many things. <clears throat> but when inner healing is going on, what God will commonly do is he will take you through these various, these series of events that have led to this complex of pain within you so that as these events become resolved, suddenly inside, as I would say, there is no tension in the system. And suddenly this person who was the body art person no longer feels the need for the body art. Does this make sense? It's a little bit like if this person over here either has the cancer fully excised or is healed through chemo or something, whatever, however that happens, healed through prayer, that would work too. Um, they're no longer in need of morphine to control the pain. It's the same thing, just a different dimension of the human system. So inner healing includes this process. Number one, feel the pain. Most of us spend a lot of time avoiding pain. We try to run away from it. We suppress it. We stuff it. In fact, all these coping mechanisms I was talking about, all of those are designed to keep us from feeling the pain because we don't like to feel pain. And that's a very human response. But the fact is God gave us pain, both emotional and physical, in order to tell us something is wrong. And so we need to pay attention when we're feeling that pain. Number two, identify the cause. Something caused that pain. In the case of Joseph, we know what it was. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. And we could probably add to that that there was a great animosity toward him. He was the outsider among his family. He was all right with his dad and his mom, but but he was an outsider with his brothers. Now, he did kind of create his own problem because he was a loudmouth and he shared about his dream where all the sun, moon, and stars bowed down to him. And they're all like, yeah, get over it, little boy. Right? We're, we're all older than you are and we're going to beat you up. I mean, that's what families do, right? That's what brothers do. So he did create his own problem. But the real proximate cause was that he'd been an outsider for a while, which he triggered, and then ultimately it led to this event where he gets sold into slavery. So locate the cause. Number three, express the pain. And by that, what I mean is own it. Don't deny it. Don't pretend that it's not there. It is there. You were damaged. You were wounded. You were hurt. Whatever happened. Number four, forgive the offender. Forgiveness is a key aspect of inner healing. It's not the only aspect, but it's a key aspect. And for what we're doing today, it's the only one we really can go into in much detail. And then number five, ask Jesus to show himself in the event in order to secure healing. Because as the old saying goes, there's nothing that I'm going to go through that I can't face with Jesus. And so, you know, it's really that sense of God being with me that, for example, allowed Paul to Face execution with confidence. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of life. Inner healing involves uh, the memory then and the stored up emotion of that memory. Usually both will be addressed in an inner healing sequence. And in the end, it heals us of the negative results by bringing uh, Jesus into those memories. Now, we're over time, but I just want to quickly say a few more things and then we'll wrap it up. Here's what inner healing is not. It is not psychiatry. It touches the what, the substance of the problem, not the why. By the way, I've found that when people want to ask why in inner healing prayer times, that is not effective. If anything, it'll quench the Holy Spirit. Usually God will not answer these questions. Now, in Joseph's case, he apparently did understand the why he had to go through this. But I'll bet he didn't when he was 17 years old. I'll bet he understood that while he was in prison and it took time to get there. So God could reveal this later on, but more commonly, you won't get that in the prayer time. Uh, Number two, inner healing is not positive thinking or exhortation. When people come for inner healing, this is not time to say, buck up, soldier. It's all going to be okay. After all, if God is for us, who can be against us? That's not what we're doing here. Inner healing is not meditation, unless we're meditating on a scripture. Inner healing is not escapism. We're actually facing the elephant. 
We're not running away from it. Inner healing is not group therapy. Now, sometimes we've seen mass or group inner healings. I did one in um, Roosevelt Island, I guess it was, a couple of years ago with a bunch of doctors and dentists and surgeons and other people from the Christian Medical and Dental Association. And, man, the entire room was pandemonium. And, I mean, all of these really smart, capable professionals were blubbering like babies. But usually it doesn't occur en masse. It's usually something that occurs in a more uh, intimate setting of one or two prayer ministers with an individual. Um, Inner healing is not a grief management program, nor is it a recovery program. Although I will say, if people go through inner healing, a lot of times that will help them with their addictive behaviors, including alcohol and drugs, as I already suggested. So inner healing is not New Age spirituality. It does not draw on occultic activity, false spirituality, Christian cults, or non-Christian religions. Inner healing relies on the power of the Holy Spirit to bring active sanctification and transformation in the soul, specifically memories and emotions in the individual. Inner healing is not a panacea. It is a tool that we use to bring people to, to wholeness, which is holiness, and it's not the only tool in the kit. It's just one tool. It's the one we're talking about today. And it also is an important tool for those who have a problem that we call hardness of heart. Hardness of heart. How do people's hearts become hard? Well, they become calloused, which is another word for jaded. And they become jaded because they've had so much difficulty and pain and grief in their life that after a while they just close themselves off. Inner healing will solve that hardness of heart issue. All right, let's let's look at a couple of verses that uh, undergird the idea of inner healing and will be done. Um, The first one is Isaiah 53. Of course, this is the famous passage that deals with the atonement. Isaiah 53 says this in verse 4, Surely he bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. Now, a lot of times in, in... kind of mainstream spirituality, conventional evangelicalism, this, this becomes a propositional truth. Yeah, yeah, Jesus died to, to you know, to deal with the uh, griefs and pains, but they don't really go anywhere with that. But, you know, all theoretical theology, all biblical theology, has a practical theology outworking to it. And so if Jesus died for our griefs and our, and our um, sorrows, then there ought to be a way to be relieved of our griefs and sorrows. And here is the longest word in the English language. It has three letters. The word is yet. Even though he carried our griefs and sorrows, nevertheless, or yet, we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. What's Isaiah saying? He's saying the day will come where the people of God will say, okay, yeah, Jesus carried our griefs and sorrows, good enough, but but really Jesus was stricken and afflicted of God. They will focus only on that and not on this. And that's where we are with much of our modern theology. And then it goes on and talks about other things that he did, but we don't have time to go there. Okay, um, Psalm 34 is another one that gives us an undergirding for the ministry of inner healing. Psalm 34 says this in verse 18, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. So when people say, well, why do you invite Jesus into the memory? Because we want him near the brokenhearted. People say, well, that's just metaphor. No, it's not. It's what the Bible says. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And he will save. He will rescue those who are crushed in spirit. So if they've had that, something is available in order to effectuate that. And, of course, our job as the the healing team is to figure out how do we bring that grace of God to bear on this individual who has a broken heart. How about this one? Uh, Psalm 147, verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He doesn't just draw near, he heals them. So there's a promise that you can be freed of your griefs and sorrows that he bore, according to Isaiah. And how about this one, Luke 4? Jesus stands up in his inaugural sermon. He's quoting from Isaiah 61. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. I am the one who is the healer, who is near the brokenhearted. So he declares that he is the great inner healer. 
in his inaugural sermon. And to release the oppressed and bring recovery of sight to the blind. So we see their inner healing, deliverance, and physical healing all laid out together. And all of this is happening because of the spirit of the Lord upon Jesus. Now, I already gave you the story of Joseph and his brothers. I have a couple of other biblical examples that we don't have time to go into, but I'll just say this and then we're done. Um, So Joseph has his experience with his brothers, but don't forget that Peter went through an inner healing. He had denied the Lord three times after being told that he would. Not a good thing to contradict a prophetic word given to you by the king himself. But Peter did because he was brash, because he was full of himself, because he was grandstanding, because he wanted to be the first among all the apostles. And so all of that's going on, and then Jesus looks at him and pierces him with just a look when he's in the courtyard, and then Jesus comes back to him while he's fishing at the Sea of Galilee, and he says to him three times, just as he had denied the Lord three times, he says, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And each time the question gets a little more intense, And it says after the third time, Peter was grieved because the Lord asked him a third time. It's like, how long are you going to ask this, Lord? Do you really need to rub it in? No, I need to heal it out. And then he says, go feed my sheep, care for my lambs. And then the disciples on the Emmaus Road, this is found in Luke 24, uh, verses 13 to 35. They're walking along. They're despondent. Jesus shows up. They don't recognize him. He says, what are you guys talking about as you're walking along? About Jesus of Nazareth, a mighty prophet. And, you know, he was handed over and was crucified. And are you the only one in Jerusalem that hasn't heard about these things? And then it says, Jesus says, oh, foolish of heart and slow to believe all that the law and the prophets have spoken. What was their problem? The same one we have today. He didn't take the Bible seriously. And so everything that had been said about him, that he had taught, it hadn't sunk in. On some level, it had been head knowledge, not heart knowledge. And so he's trying to move it further down into the the heart. So he does that. And suddenly, their eyes are opened, and then, poof, he's gone. He was only needed long enough to set him free in that context. So a lot of times when people are going through inner healing, they'll be like, wait, wait, I want to stay in the moment, but he's gone. It's because he already did the healing. And he wants you to be able to get on with your life. So when we pray for inner healing, we start with specific feelings or emotions or memories. Specifics. We want specific emotions or memories or feelings. We're generally dealing with hurts, fears, guilts, or lacks. There can be a few other categories, but those are the big four. Hurts, things that have been done that harmed you. Fears, what you're afraid of. Again, these can be hitting you emotionally or in your mind. Um, guilt over things that have gone on that you did. Guilt is usually something you did. There is false guilt that some people carry. They don't realize they're actually not to blame, and they think they are. This, by the way, is very common with children that have been molested. They think they're to blame, but they didn't do it. They're a child, but they carry a false guilt. But still, they can be freed of that guilt. And then lack, people that have been deprived. When you're praying, look for the first instance or the worst instance. These are not the same, usually, but they can be. Sometimes the worst time it happened to them, if it's a repeated event, sometimes the first time is the absolute worst. Other times there's a first and later a worst, or I guess for you, a first and a worst, because the timeline's running that way. So when you're, do- when you're doing this, look for, the, look for the first case, look for the worst case. You may need to pray into both and bring closure to both. If you do that, even if there's 2,395 other instances, you probably don't need to deal with those. You need to deal with the first and the worst. Just saying. So my guess with Joseph in his prison time experience, his first time of rejection would have been when his brothers rejected his dream. The worst instance would have been when they sold him into slavery. And then he might have had a subsequent thing with what happened with Potiphar's wife, but that's a different group of people. So it's actually a different complex of problems that probably needed resolution also. Um, Bring in Jesus or the Father or the Holy Spirit. Now, I have a whole block of teaching we won't get to dealing with when you pick one versus the other. So for just straight line, getting out of the gate, starting to pray for inner healing, 
Just ask Jesus to come into the memory. Most people have a better job visualizing him because they know that he was in the flesh. And most of us have at least a baseline understanding, depending on how well it's worked out in our spirituality, that Jesus is not only our Lord, he is our friend. And so as you bring Jesus into the memory, break the power of the memory. Literally say the words, I break the power of this memory or of this emotion. And then ask the Holy Spirit to wash away the residue. Sometimes people can't see Jesus, and if that's the case, that will normally be because they have something blocking them from Jesus. We call it an idol, but it's something that stands between them and him. That something is here. So ask the Lord to reveal what that idol is so it can be confessed or removed, and that will allow them then to see Jesus and to receive the freedom that they need. One of the things that's important about inner healing that's distinctive or distinct from uh, Sozo, which is a very popular inner healing set of tools uh, made, uh, made famous through Bethel Church in Redding, California. But one of the things that is very distinct about inner healing, as all of the people I named at the very front um, articulated it, is that you can actually describe, as the prayer minister, you can describe what you are seeing. With Sozo, you are not allowed to do that. You simply let the person articulate what they see. But there is a prophetic dimension to inner healing, and people who are visionary, people who are prophetic, many times they will see things from the past, the future, whatever. Now, you've got to be careful with this, though, and I really want to stress this, so please pay attention to what I'm saying right here. With the inner healing component, if you are going to function in that prophetic dimension, do not say this. I see this. This is what happened to you. I know you were molested as a child because I see you being molested. Don't do that. And never mind the tone of voice, that kind of firmness and certainty. What, what would be a better thing to say is, you know, I'm seeing something here. It looks like a molestation scene. Were you ever molested as a child? Do you have a memory of that? We don't heal false memories. We deal real memories. And so the person has to have the memory. But a lot of times the Lord will actually prompt the prayer minister with something like that, but don't make it a declarative, dogmatic thing where you box people in. Because I've run into a lot of people say, well, you know, I was in this prayer session and so-and-so said this happened to me. I don't remember it, but well, they said it happened, so I know it had to have happened. And I feel really like I conflicted and kind of shameful and dirty, but I, I, I'm just going to go with it. That does not bring about resolution. That just brings about more confusion. So if you, if you are, as the prayer minister, seeing something, just bring it up as a possibility and ask, do they remember what you are seeing? If they do, pray into it. If they don't, just drop it, move on. Okay, and then finally, release from trauma. Now, there's two kinds of trauma. There's chronic trauma, which derives from either deprivation or neglect or abandonment and rejection. Joseph had chronic trauma. Why? Deprivation in an Egyptian prison neglect, totally cut off from his family, abandonment by his brothers, rejection by his brothers. Okay, That's chronic trauma. It tends to be obviously long-term and cumulative. Acute trauma is significant distress of a particular type that affects the emotions, the relationships, and spiritual growth. Joseph also had acute trauma. So you want to be sensitive to these two categories. Some people will have only one or the other. But you pray for uh, deprivation and neglect, abandonment and rejection a little bit differently. You ask for the embrace of God, generally the Father or the Spirit, but it could be Jesus as the elder brother putting his arm around you. That's how you heal the chronic trauma. When it's acute trauma, you pray into that specific memory of that event. Ask for a release of any body memories. This would be the effect that's stored in the flesh the meat of the body from whatever happened and ask God to wash away the shame. So that's a basic prayer model.